Hi everyone, this is Doug Nelson with Precision Neuromuscular Therapy. And what we really do in many ways is teaching clinical reasoning. We're moving away from, and the, in the olden days, <clears throat> my uh, approach, uh, as well as many other people, was kind of recipe driven. There was kind of a low back routine, there, there was a shoulder routine, that sort of thing. If somebody came in with this problem, here's what you did. The problem with that is it's sort of, um, I have a fabulous answer and I hope it matches your question kind of approach, which is in a lot of ways a, a kind of a goofy way to go about things and it's what I did for years. And, and it's really menu driven. And uh, you know, I have a clinic here in Champaign I've had for 36 years and we have, I have 18 therapists on staff. And when people look at our website, they often wonder where's your like menu of services? Uh, we don't really have one. People come in and yes, there's a period of time we spend with them, but it's really one of two things. It's either more general work or very specific problem solving. So there's no like, here's what we do and, and this is what we have to offer and I hope it fits into your, the box that you're coming in with. We sit down with you and we tailor the session to exactly what you need. <clears throat> and that's really important because as a therapist, I think all of us want to be um, want to be artists, not just technicians. If uh, Who wants to be a cook when you could be a chef? And there's a big difference between those two things. And a lot of it has to do with the richness of the work and the artistry part of it. I don't want to do recipes. I want to, I want to create. And I want to create that with the client who walks in the door. And I've done this for a long time. This is now my... I'm, in the 41st year of doing the work. And um, I've seen a lot of things come and go. You know, you see the next newest, greatest thing, and it's a flash in the pan, and whoa! And then five years from now, you never hear another thing about it. And But some things have come, and they've stayed for, for decades or <clears throat> centuries because there's substance to those things. And I think that's really, really important. So for me, this work... And the style of work has been around for many, many decades because there is substance to this. So while other things have come and gone, we have deep roots and we're rooted in clinical experience and evidence-informed practice. I see, I think it's about 1,200 people a year. Again, the clinic sees about 300 people a week. Um, this isn't some theory. This isn't me sitting in front of a laptop looking at things and go, wow, this would be really cool. This is lived in the clinic every day. And if you look at each one of my teaching staff, from Seth to Julie to James, to, they're all seeing a ton of people. They're all fabulous cl clinicians. <clears throat> so when people ask us a question about some specific approach, you know, we can speak from the experience base of saying, I've seen this many people who have that. And also I think you'll find with my teaching staff, if we haven't seen, you know, a whole bunch of people who've had that specific condition and we don't know the literature, we won't share an opinion with you because opinions are easy and facts are really hard. So I know that frustrates some people because you want to say, well, don't you think that in many ways it doesn't matter what you think. Because sometimes what seems obvious and seems logical doesn't really work. And we're only interested in that which works. So uh, an important point. The longer I do this, the clearer I get about what the mission is. And that mission to me is that people who have soft tissue pain often fall through the cracks of our healthcare system. In that, um, you know, I've always said, if you break your arm, and you can afford it, there are amazing services available to you. <clears throat> but if you have arm pain, if you have pain at the lateral epicondyle, you officially have a problem because it's not clear who can actually help you with that. And I would posit that people who do what we do, very targeted, very precise soft tissue work, that's who you should see. Unfortunately, there just aren't enough people to serve the overwhelming amount of people, everyday folks out there who really hurt and they do not realize that soft tissue pain is at the heart of the daily discomfort that they feel. 
there was a study in Switzerland, I think, that looked at people who have neck pain. And there were over 11,000 people in the study. And the question was, what is the source of their neck pain? As you might imagine, if you take a broad category like neck pain, there's a whole lot of reasons that you could have. You could have arthritic changes. You could, I mean, it's a long list. 87.5% of those people were found to have soft tissue dysfunction as the source of their neck discomfort. <clears throat> wow. But then who treats that? I would say that falls to us. And we need to accept that responsibility and just be incredibly good at being able to address it. So that's on us, right? But the need is overwhelming. And the longer I do this, it seems like that need keeps growing and growing instead of um, getting smaller. And actually, if you look at the demographics and the data, that seems to be supported by that. The, the facts bear that out. One of the frustrating things is, for most cases, there's really nothing to see in an MRI. So you have somebody with kind of non-specific low back pain. Imaging doesn't help. An x-ray is not going to help. <clears throat> in fact, the American Academy of Family Physicians tells their physicians, if someone comes in with you know, low back pain for that first time, do not image. Uh, in the last research article I saw, that's followed by 16, one six, 16 percent of all physicians. Because that model is, if we look inside there, we'll see what's really wrong. I don't, this isn't the place for that, but there's a lot of evidence to show that that's kind of faulty logic, <clears throat> that it comes from the biomechanical model, that everything that is that a source of pain can be seen, identified, and therefore eliminated, which is a lovely idea. It's a crappy reality, but it's a lovely idea. And I also understand that the process of treating these kinds of uh, problems take time, and it's, uh, it's not linear, it's messy in the sense that um, it's not, okay, someone comes in with low back pain, you need like three sessions and you do this and then you do that and then we're done here. Oh gosh, if it were only true. <clears throat> Oftentimes there are, there are twists and turns, it's unpredictable. It's what's called the stochastic arts, arts, stochastic arts, which means that there are twists and turns and unexpected uh, revelations through the process. That is just the way it is. It's uh, I was teasing my, my clients, it's uh, the work is exhilarating when it's not infuriating because there are twists and turns everywhere. But that's what great problem solving is all about. And speaking of problem solving, you know, clients don't come in with these post-it notes. So, okay, you need to start here and then you need to do this and then you do that. Um, we have to make decisions and I don't think people realize, therapists, massage therapists realize, how many decision points you have at any point in a therapeutic uh, encounter. And that's probably the topic for another thing because we could dive into that. But there are choices to be made. <clears throat> the real question is, are you making those choices by default or are you making those choices by design? And that, um, is something to really ponder and spend some time with. Why did you do what you do? We are very much into the science of the work, but I strongly want to emphasize that embracing the science does not mean to abandon the art. In fact, embracing the science, having this deep understanding actually deepens the art. I've worked with really, really high level athletes in the NBA and the NFL, worked for several teams. I've worked with um, artists in the music and dance world who are at the very pinnacle um, names you would know. Um, <clears throat> these people, I've never met anyone in any of those performance environments who hasn't, and in an almost an insane obsessive way, really just embrace the science of the very thing that they do, they do down to nuances that the rest of us would find like, oh my gosh, somewhere short of a narcoleptic convention. But they are so into the, the smallest details of what they do 
And as a result of that, you know, we sit back and if it's a, if it's Yo-Yo Ma and you're listening to him play the cello, you're not impressed by what he plays. You are moved, but it took a lot of work to get to that point. And, uh, and people like that make it look effortless and we're lost in the art of it. But there's no way to get to the art without the science and the discipline. It's, there's just no way that I've ever seen. So <clears throat> part of our focus is to be efficient and effective. And for several reasons, it's both efficient and effective for the client and efficient and effective for us as well. It's very much like good language in a way in terms of being uh, efficient. There's a difference between poetry and prose. And in one, you don't have the time to use a lot of extra words. You have to think about what you say. And, uh, and that clarity of communication is really important. And it's not about the number of words you use. It's about the specificity and clarity of what you're trying to communicate. And I, I would hope that you understand that concept. I would also posit that if I explain that concept for another 20 minutes, you would be totally confused. More does not make it better. The same thing in the treatment room. We are trying to, to, to really uh, narrow our focus so that we get the most effect with the least amount of extraneous anything, actually. And, and again, that kind of focus takes a lot of skill to be able to make happen. And also, it's about being effective. And what does effective mean? It means that you have an appreciable and hopefully measurable uh, difference in the quality of life and the functional capacity of the client. So this is yet another thing, but how do you measure effectiveness? Well, one of the best ways to do that is through functional um, uh, scoring. So for instance, uh, how do you know you're better? That's what I would always say to clients. Like when someone comes in, <laughs> this happened today, someone said, wow, I'm so much better. My thing is, really? How do you know that? And they look a little surprised and then their answer is, well, um, I did this and I did that and I did this and I wasn't able to do that before. As one of my clients just said, I went for a mile walk you know, like three times this week. I couldn't walk for more than two blocks uh, two weeks ago. So yeah, I'm better. And my response is, yep, seems like you are. It's not like how much pain, pain I'm in at the present moment. It's really looking at functional capacity over a much larger window because that pain experience can fluctuate from moment to moment. That's really not a very good indicator. So, um, but for us in terms of being effective as well, are there ways that you can measure this? For instance, we, one of the things that we do is range of motion measurements. And those are very clear. If somebody has 37 degrees of right rotation of their cervical spine and we work with them and they have, you know, 52 afterwards, that's a measurable and clear difference. Anytime we can do that, anytime we can quantify something as well as using the qualitative measurements, we'll do, we'll, the hope is to do both of those things. So when somebody asks me, well, what is precision neuromuscular therapy? At its heart, it's really three things. It's about deductive reasoning. I know that sounds not exactly exciting, but actually it's, it's what makes the work really rich and really deep. It's evidence or informed based and it's client centered. Let me actually take the last two first and then I'll move back to deductive. What do I mean by evidence based or informed based? What that means is that there's evidence uh, based is that there's literature, the research literature to back up what you say. So when we say, you know what, I think uh, the pectoralis minor muscle is actually really important. One wouldn't think about this, but actually really important in shoulder impingement cases. Actually, the research data, that idea comes from the research data. This is how we know this. Um, that, um, you know, the literature is vast and deep and not limited to our own profession, but you can certainly explore that if you go to uh, the 
the IJTMB.org, the International Journal of Massage and Body Work. Um, I think you'll find tons of great case reports and research studies. That's a great place for all of you to, to look at um, research in our own field. And it's for massage therapy, our own peer-reviewed PubMed index journal. Evidence-informed, evidence, um, excuse me, based, is also the fact that someone like myself, who's been practicing for four decades and in the clinic and seeing a ton of people every week, if I tell you that I've seen, you know, f you know, 50 people who have a frozen shoulder, and in the majority of cases, you know, this is a reasonable approach. Yeah, there may be no research to back that up, but the clinical data, my own experience, is also valid. All formal research comes from some informal beginnings. And when I say client-centered, that means that the client should feel that everything you do is targeted just for you. And it's that sense. It's not exactly a rich and rewarding experience if you're the client and you know that what you received is the same thing that the last person that got off the table is and the next person is going to get kind of the same thing. That's not exactly a rich experience. That feeling of, oh my goodness, that was just for me, that's what client-centered means. So now the deductive part of it. Um, one axiom that we have is there for every symptom, there are multiple possible reasons for this. So if you take, so our job then is for every symptom that somebody presents, what are all the possible reasons that that could happen? For instance, if you look at someone who has low back pain and for everything you name, um, how is it that you could rule that in or rule that out? So if you say, oh, low back pain, QL, really? And you would think this, why? Not just because people have said this, but is there a limitation in this range? Is there a known history that would make sense with this? Is the QL painful on contraction? Is there some structural asymmetry that would point to this? Is there some known referral that would point to this? It's the, it's, how can you confirm and disconfirm everything you say? And what doesn't work well in terms of confirming and disconfirming is, oh, this was tender and this wasn't. Because painfully, I've learned over the years that that is not a very efficient way to rule things in and out. Because things that aren't involved, can uh, you can get a lot of false positives. That's something that's quite tender. Uh, ultimately, won't get you what you want. It's just tender but it's not a cause that's different and can be really frustrating. So really what we're teaching is that analytic assessment part of it and clinical reasoning to help you decide what to treat so that you're treating the right thing for the right reason at the right time and in the right way.